rockstar. You can find me in VIP or I saw me. Yeah, where the girls are. This is how your nights will be. All right, all right. Welcome everybody to Go Go Talks, brought to you by Go Go I am your host, Malachi Johns. Thank you for joining us today. Today we are joined by the one and only Funky Stuff Wink. How are you, sir? All right, hey everybody. How y'all doing? Go Go Wink, JYB for life. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's good to see you, man. It's been a long time, man. How you doing? Man, it's a pleasure, man. The holler had you, man. Get to hang with the man who woke the city up. Oh, man. <laughs> well, thank you for that. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Yeah, I tell him all the time, man. Malachi woke y'all up. <laughs> I thank you, yeah. man. Just trying to follow in y'all footsteps, man. Y'all set the path. Y'all set the path. Man, do what you doing. Create that whole new lane. That's what you do. Keep doing what you doing. Oh, man, I really appreciate it. That means a lot, man. Thank you so much. So, hey, look, you pull that door open, we going to push. All right. That's what's up. That's what's up, man. Well, can you? Yeah, uh, you keep pulling, we going to keep pushing. Uh, That's what I'm going to do. You pull, I'm going to push. All right. Sounds good. Sounds good. Can you can you give everybody sort of your 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 uh, your story of how you got started in the music and 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 you know how you got in junkyard and all that. Give everybody your your background that doesn't that might not know already. Wow. Well, I started in music through through family. You know what I'm saying? There's always music played in my house. Then I had uncles that's from that's in New York. They from the Dominican Republic, and they played on conga drums. And I had a great uncle named Herman. Man had this one Congo in his basement, Slim, and my uncle used to get every sound that we use in Go Go out that one Congo. I, oh, really? It used to amaze me when I was a kid, man. I was like, man, how you keep doing that? So he used to make me sit right there for hours, Malachi, wow. and bang on that joint till I learned what I was doing. So this was in New York. Out 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 in DC. I hear you. This was in New York, or this was in DC that he was teaching you? Nah, this was in Clinton, Maryland. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, this was out Clinton, Maryland. My 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 cup, my big cut. My uncle had a uh, ranch out there in Clinton. Nice. Back in the day, so all the family used to go out there, but I used to go out there all the time. Cause I used to want to help with the stable and all that stuff, so I used to be out there all through the year. So when man, long story short, that's what few was what kicked the fire off with, with led to funky stuff right now. And as far as junkyard, I was nine years old, Malachi, when we started okay. that band. Well, tell us, I tell us. You, you don't. You don't have to make the long story short. We got plenty of time. So tell us. Tell us the okay, whole story. Okay. 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 Well, everybody, <laughs> Junkyard was not always a band. We was Boy Scouts at one time, right? Mm -hmm. But at one time, we were at, during the summer of uh, I say seventy nine, right? Mm -hmm. We uh, school was getting ready to let out, so they took the program. So the program closed, so we couldn't do the parade stuff no more. Cause school was getting right closed, so Bugs had an idea we gonna keep it going. So we used to strap around. We used to go behind Bowman's store. It's a little corner store used to be in Bird Farm. We used to uh, go behind the store and grab all these boxes and stuff, and go get some little string and tie tie the string around our waist with the boxes and act like we was a parade band walking around Bird Farm, <laughs> banging on boxes. But look. And we did that for like for like two, three weeks. Then uh, mass extinction popped up in our, our picnic area. And they started setting up the speakers and all that stuff, right? So mass extinction kicked the summer off. So we used to always see kept saying, looking at the, how the arrangement, how our band looked. And then when the band get to kicking, we sitting on the little wall just Watching that shit, man, throughout that whole summer. So when 1980 came, we took it a little further. We built our own little band. That's when we started piecing little stuff together. Mm -hmm. But before we can even get the piece of everything together, 
it was like three, four bands inside Bird Farm. Oh, for real? They had beat you to it? everybody was bowing at each other inside the farms. Okay. You know so who, who, are, so who were some of the other bands that were doing that at the time? So you had Heavy One had a band down okay. at the bottom of Eden Road. Me and Buzz had a band, little band, at the at the top of Eden Road in the middle. And Irvin and them had it. Irvin, that's who the original drummer, one of the original drummers is. It wasn't just heavy one. Everybody keep thinking it was heavy one. It okay. wasn't just heavy one. It was three drummers in the in the stair step of junkyard back then. You know what I'm saying? It was three drummers. One name Ant Mob, that's his name, Joe Eatland. And then you had Irvin Hope. And then you had Heavy One. You know what I'm saying? Heavy One just he could he could more than they could. So Big Dirt stuck with Heavy One. Okay, so, but, so yeah, but, before, on, on, but before that he had his own band and y'all had your own band. Yeah, everybody had a little band around there. So everybody used to battle. We used to come in the middle of Eaton Road. That's right in the smack middle of Bird Farm. In right. this big old little playground, everybody got a little corner, and we just started banging. Everybody just started banging. Whoever little shit got a little lock to it, that's who gonna win. So man, boys get mad at at at, at, at this one particular day, right? Because mm-hmm. everyone little little in them they was little locking a little bit. Boys got mad one time and just. <laughs> Fucked everybody shit up. You hear me? Knocked over everybody shit. Started <laughs> stealing that niggas and everything. So everybody ran. So Big Dirt came in the picture. That's when it shit started piecing together. Big Dirt come in the picture because he was more like the, uh, he was up there with the new band. So he knew how to structure things a little bit more, right? Mm-hmm. So he got us all together. So he had a little, he built a little contest where he got, got everybody to play. He wanted to pick the, the best members out of each of them bands. And he built one band. Okay. And I wasn't a part of that part yet. Just yet. Because I was too goddamn little. You know okay. what I'm saying? I was I was the baby. So they wasn't trying to let me squeeze in. So I had to muscle a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Because I was little. So I go get my uncles. I go get my uncles, make my uncles go at uh, Big Dirt, the, the manager who was becoming the manager at the time. Okay. Tell him, man, look, my little nephew know how to play. Probably better than half of these dudes. He actually be banging on instruments, man. Mm-hmm. So, man, check him out, you know? He, he just learned the little go because I just come back, like, like two, three years before that, I just come back from New York because a lot of my family in New York. Right. So a little bit of my upbringing, I was up there. I ain't come back till I was like six, almost about to be seven. Mm-hmm. So that that when I first heard that go go shit, it, it blew my fucking mind, dog. Busting loose was cranking so hard that summer, Slim. I ain't never heard something that sounds so good right then and there, Joe. Indeed. Indeed. And my my. My big cousins was like a like a DJ, you know what I'm saying? He used to be the DJ at a lot of the American Leagues and all that shit back then. And mm-hmm. he's still doing it, you know what I'm saying? Man, we had a cookout at his house this, this summer, man. Just right when the, the peak of the motherfucking junk was getting ready to start blowing up, man. Man, he played this motherfucking bust a loose slam. The way them Congos was cranking with them drums, slamming that cowbell. Man, I went back to New York the next year, man. I said, man, I ain't coming back up here no more. Listen to this, cuz. <laughs> I let my cousin hear. He was like, whoa, what the hell kind of music is that? Man, it didn't went from there, man. I ain't even lying. Junk. It, it was an experience, too, man. You hear me, Malika? Indeed. Indeed. So, okay, so you, so you come back down from New York. Your your cousin is saying, "Hey, you know, put." Yeah, my uncle put, pressed, oh, pressed, oh. pressed Big Dirk out. He pressed Big Dirk out, so they let me they let me try out. So when he seen that I knew how to coordinate my little my little beats, right? So he tried me out. I ain't oh. I ain't get the bang off the break. 
I was on the front lines, man. Oh, for you were on the front line? Yeah, see, ain't nobody never knew that. I never knew that. I never heard that. That's yeah, I was on the front line at first. I was up there with Bugs. You know, that was my man, so he always wanted me right there where he at. You know what I'm saying? So he always wanted me right by him at, at the time. You know what I'm so saying? I, so I, I dealt with the I, a, I dealt I, with the I, little front lines because they had already got little things structured. You know what I'm saying? At the time, uh, Pratt and uh, this dude named John Jerry, we call him Dude. They mm -hmm. was like back and forth with the bongos back there. You know what I'm saying? So how did you go from from you said your uncle was teaching you how to get all of the sounds out of one drum? How did you translate that? Like when did you learn how to move that to across all four? Like how did you learn how to do that? Jungle Boogie. Okay. Okay. So just five ten or Jungle Boogie. They play R E played down Berry Farm in the recreation center. They were setting up. They were still setting up. Somehow Jungle Boogie was out there a little, little early than most of the other band members was. Mm -hmm. So at that time he was putting a whole new head on one of them Congos. And while he was tuning that joint up and testing his other Congo, I was standing there. And I just kept standing there. I wouldn't move. I mean, he tried to tell me, look out, little Charlotte, let me get right here. I wouldn't move. You know what I'm saying? I was determined to find out how he played that motherfucker that one on one beat. Right. I was geeked out off that beat. You know what I'm saying? Because the way he used to play it, man, used to be crisping his arms, man. He'll put his hand way in the air with that mom. I was like, God damn, what the fuck is that he doing? I want to do that. Fuck the drums. I want to do that. Right. You know what I'm saying? My, I knew how to play drums real good. You know what I'm saying? Back then. Oh, okay. So but you, I wasn't feeling shit. You know what I'm saying? That shit ain't so, feel tough to me. So basically, you were you were T Bob before T Bob then. So you played the drums, the congos, and you was on the front line. So you like the original T Bob. I, I pretty much yeah. I, I set it off then. I ain't even look at it that way. Either. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I started off on the front line. And before the year out, I was back there on the cans because we had a little can set. We had a little bucket set mm -hmm. and two can sets. Mm -hmm. And the, the two dudes, which me, me and Lou, we played the uh, played the cans. We had two cowbells, one big, one big one like they use in the go go now, and then we had a medium joint. We had a a, a routine where we used to play cowbell beats off of each other. Okay. It was a crazy little system, man. Big Dick created the little system, you know what I'm saying, through the parade stuff. Man, he had a little system, man, with, with how they playing the cowbell rack now. Me and, me and another dude played the beats like that. It's just me and him playing off of each other, though. Okay. So, so yeah. Somebody has, somebody has a question. Alfonso Claiborne has a question. He wanted to know if you can name the original members of the band. Like who was there from the, from the beginning, at the beginning. Oh, uh, okay. Oh my God, that's a whole lot of people, Joe. Uh, you got- oh, just The very first, the very first, the first one, because you mentioned there was three drummers, so who was the first drummer? Who was the yeah, first- I'm gonna give you all the drummers. I'm gonna give you all them drummers. Okay. I'm gonna just give you all the members. Okay. You know what I'm saying? I'm gonna give you all the members that was there. You know what I'm saying? It was Bugs. You had Tony Dak, you had uh, John Judd, you had Jane Pratt, you had Keith Mack, you had Heavy One, you had uh, uh, Irvin Ho, you had uh, Mike Strong, you had uh, Lil Dave, you know what I'm saying? Who else? Chung Young, that was the, the, that was the original keyboard player with Baker. It was Chung Young, and then it was my brother Pop. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Then it was Lil Pop. You know what I'm saying? Lil Pop was on the front line. That's how I got back in the back. So he That's took how I got to the bottom. He took your spot on the front line and you moved to the Congo. No, Pop moved, Pop took Pop took his own spot. They get they, they created that whole spot for Pop on the front line. Which somebody had which Pret had got suspended. At this time, right? 
I didn't realize Pratt, I thought Pratt came later. I didn't realize he was there that early. He was man, Pratt was there day one, man. They were day one. Okay. Pratt was there day one. Then you had Lou. Lou played Lewis. They played the cans with me. You had uh Bobby Green. You know what I'm saying? That was these the front line, the original front line dudes, man. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And uh who else, man? It's a whole man. I I can't even remember them right now. To be it's honest, all good. It's, it's, it's all good. It's all good. They just wanted to know the first the first round, so it's all good. Uh, yeah, that's the first, that's the first round right there. I okay. gave you the first round right there. Okay, cool, cool. That's so okay, so you so you so you guys have graduated from from the boxes with the strings, and now you're playing on on the on you know what 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 people most know of the legend is. Uh, the buckets, the buckets in the can. Yeah, we had we had a, a, a creative old head around our way, right? Mm-hmm. That just he just showed us how to, you know, what I'm saying, improvise. Being though we, we we didn't have real equipment, he was like, "Man, y'all can make your own equipment, man. Let me show y'all how to do stuff." Man, he took us down, walked us down the avenue one day. Man, we went all through back alleys and all that. He grabbed uh. Broke table legs off of old tables, man. We went down the phone company, man. We took a whole like three stacks of cones, stole a whole bunch of cones, and then this this little this little joint, this, this little ball place used to be down southwest before they did all that gentrification right there with nationals at now. Mm-hmm. This used to be a bucket place right there, man. We used to wait till the late night and jump the gate over, over at the ball place. And I used to climb all the way up this motherfucking ladder, man. Look like I was in an attic. <laughs> and I used to be pushing them motherfucking rolls of buckets off that joint. They like, man, Sim Wink up there, he ain't scared of nothing. He ain't scared of nothing, man. Let him go. So I used to climb the gate. I ain't scared. I I go at the dog that was back there and everything. I ain't care. I ain't got the dog scared of me now. So every time I came to the gate, the dog never came back to the gate. So I started squeezing through the hole now. So, right. Yeah, I'm pushing buckets over this little thing. Look like an attic, man. Then I climb back down and by the time I get down that ladder and shit, every one of them done already got the buckets and shit over the gate and shit. We been put them back in the van. Man, we gone. We back down Bird Farm. Now we trying to pull all these buckets apart. And then and every time we pull them buckets apart, each of them buckets had different pitch sounds. Mm-hmm. So that's how we started getting our little sound together, man. We started toning the motherfucking buckets a certain way, man. Some buckets, we used to put a piece of tape on it a certain way to make it sound a certain way. And then one one summer, when we got there, I had my dad done brought me a drum set. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And I did some old crazy shit to this drum set. I took it apart and made a junkyard set. Saying, gay heavy will told everyone, use my bass drum. At first, we at first we used to play our bass like hand, like this. Mm-hmm. Before heavy was playing drums like that. Heavy always knew how to play the original way, mm-hmm. but Irvin and them created it the hand way. You know what I'm saying? Irvin and Amar created the hand way, and then heavy one cold just turned them all out. Man, played everything they was playing the original way with the doubles and the triples and everything. So Big Dirk was like, "Oh yeah, he can really be the drummer." That's the drummer right there. <laughs> so, yeah. And after a while, man, we just started learning as we was going, man. And then we played at a lot of Department of Recreation, man, is what made Junkyard everybody know it now. You know what I'm saying? Oh, so was that the show? Was that with the showmobile? Or? That's the showmobile. That's the beginning of the showmobile. That was the, the beginning of it. We was the beginning of that showmobile, that program. Mm-hmm. We was the beginning of it. You know what I'm saying? The first seed of it. Because we was going everywhere. Even without the show, my bill, we played in every goddamn wreck in Washington, D.C. The white people's wreck, the, the, the African people's recreation, we, we played in every last recreation in Washington, D.C. That's how that's how Junkyard got known so fast. Department of Recreation. So at, at so you mentioned the, the the white people's recreation center. What was the reaction then? 
Like, was it all white people there, or what? What did they do? How did no, they no, 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 no. We just oh, see yeah. that because you, you, you know you was at a different type of recreation yeah. than the recreations we normally you. know. I got you. I got you. I know what you mean. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. Got you. Got you. Okay. So, all right. So you're playing. You guys are are, are are rocking the showmobile. And what year is this? What year is the showmobile? Or roughly what years? Man, we talking about like eighty two, eighty three. Mm-hmm. 84, 85. So when you guys started Junkyard, what was, what did you, like, what was the goal? Like, what did you want to, who was, who were you looking to to say, we want to be like that? Was it Chuck Brown? Was it Perez? It's like, who was, who were you looking at to say, that's what we want to do? It was, it was more, it was more like trouble. Okay. Okay. Got, got big trouble because we you know we can walk to Malu de King Avenue and walk to the walk bridge that leads you over across Sula Parkway. You can stand on the walk bridge and hit trouble front practice. Okay. Because Tony Fisher was right across the goddamn home parkway from us. We can always go over there and, and sit and, and watch him sit on the post playing with his base. Mm-hmm. But you knew before the day out the niggas gonna be in that backyard cranking like a mug. Right. Well, so was yeah, it, I, was it was it just that they were, were were close by, or was it something about their sound that made you really? Because they they obviously had somewhat. I mean, at least you know from my my young recollection and from what I know, they you know they were a little bit more experimental with the traditional you know uh, patterns and beats and sounds. You know. Yeah. Playing the traditional Mr. Magic beat, they would they would mix it up a little bit. So was that influential to you too? Was that what attracted you to them? That's that was more influential to me because that's what helped me create who I am right there. Because trouble always was outside the box. Right. Right. Man, trouble was the shit to me back then. Now. Yeah. I ain't even lying. And then. They they used to transform so much, man. Trouble had like three different bands, man. Inside of Trouble, they had a little band called Tilt Slim. They used to be like Star Wars, man, on the stage. Joe, they was dressed up like little robots and all, man. That shit what? used to be bomb, Slim. Oh, I never knew that. I never knew that. I, I, I be telling, man. I was deep in the, in that go go. Once I got in it, I was in it, Slim. Yeah. I ain't even lying. I jumped off the porch at an adolescent, man. No knowledge or nothing. I was ready to go. <laughs> I yeah, man. I mean, it, it was the same thing for me, obviously, a later, a little later, but once once I was there, I was just like, okay, this is just like it's been this the centerpiece, you know, like everything in my life just revolves around go go in some type of way. Like it's just something that's so powerful about the music that just isn't. At, isn't that powerful about other types of music? Even though I like a lot of other types of music, there's nothing like go go. You know what I mean? And, hey. Yeah, it just isn't anything like it in the world anyway. It's a whole body of music that's just untouched. Yeah. And then soon, soon as you touch it, it's like people that ain't already used to. As soon as they touch it, it's like they they can't let it go. It's it's, it's like they're immune to it now. They stuck to it. Yeah. They stuck to it. I be like, man, wow, this shit is wicked, weird. I say this. The music speak to me. That's why I say my own, own original type. I don't like playing. I don't even listen to Go Go Miley. For real? Yeah, I, I don't even listen to it because I, I think it messes with my creativity. You oh. know what I'm saying? I like to stay outside the box, so I don't like to even listen to Go Go. So yeah. I want to listen to everything. Oh, I'm gonna challenge my beat to somebody else's music. If you are a band member and you are uh, and you are watching right now, I, I want you to pay attention to what what Wink just said. He 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 wants to make sure that he's going to challenge his creativity, and I think that's something. I mean, we'll get into that later, but that's something that's really <laughs> from Go Go from Go Go for a very long time. So okay, but all right, I don't want to keep interrupting your story. So okay, so we're on the buckets and cans. It's eighty two, eighty three. You're doing the show mobile, and then when um. You know, like when do you really start to feel it? T- 
take it off and then when does you know like when does mo shorter come in when does the def jam thing come in what are, what are some other big milestones along the way so i say from like 82 i say to like 80 86 because when 86 came that's when it started getting real serious because we was growing up we were starting we was coming in the teenagers and stuff bulls and them already teenagers and all that so they, they they dealing with girls and stuff. So the emotions and all that and stuff playing and everything. So we growing up now. You know what I'm saying? Right. So everything's starting to change. You know what I'm saying? So we we, we want to do different. We starting to try different styles of stuff. So now we're looking at our big brothers in Go Go. You know what I'm saying? Now that's when we starting to try to get our style together. Because at first we was just it was just fun to us. We was playing. You know what I'm saying? And we was just playing for the people. Just to keep the smiles on the, just to keep the smiles on the on the peers that was our age, you know what I'm saying? So from that's all the So from to eighty-two, you were just playing, and then eighty-two. So three years of playing before you really say, okay, we really need to really develop our start to develop our style. Yeah, we was playing like Vendors Mall, Georgetown. Them, them. That's what made it fun. Mm-hmm. When we seen that we can make all types and di- I mean all types of diverse of people party just like they party over southeast, right? You know what I'm saying? That's that's what woke a lot of us up. That, that it was just bigger than us just feeling like we want to just play. It was bigger than that. Now we see it now. You know what I'm saying? So now Buzz getting getting his style together now. You know what I'm saying? He wants. Do what funk and them doing, you know what I'm saying? Grab the people like Tony and all them do when they when they doing their shows and stuff. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And then Lil Benny was his man, Sam. Oh yeah. When when Bugs used to see Lil Benny and how he used to control that stage, man, Bugs used to be wide the fuck open, Sam. I ain't never used to see my man so in a month in a trance like, I'm gonna do that, man. Watch out, watch, 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 Wink. We can really do that, Wink. That's what kicked it off. That's what really kicked it off for us, man. When he so when, when him and Lil Benny got to sit down and they got to chopping, Bugs really opened up after that, man. He really got into his craft uh, and he just took off. Mm-hmm. He just took off. So, John Bugs really influenced you. Benny really influenced uh, Bugs. That's 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 dope. Um, so Rick for everyone. What's that? Tricky Rick was was he- heavy one's inspiration. You know okay. what I'm saying? Because Rick used to come around the farms back then before we even had a band. Because mm-hmm. Rick and uh, heavy one uncle they played drums. That's how heavy one was so smooth with it because he was already getting taught before we even knew it. Right. Right. So, so when did when did Mo Shorter come into the picture? Mo was always there. Always, always you know there. what I'm saying? Mo was like a quiet guidance. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. He made sure uh, Big Dick knew what he was doing with us. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. He showed Big Dick doing the right thing. You know what I'm saying? If an illegal thing had to come up, Mo, Mo stepped in and helped out. Then I, after a while, from him helping out, he's saying this is his place. After a while, he just took over. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Then Big Dick had started messing up. You know, this we talking about 86 now. You know what I'm saying? Everybody getting into the streets and all that. It was a wicked point right then and at, at that time for Junkyard. Because we was, we was like at a crossroad. Then I know if they wanted to go hard or really play music. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But you know, at that time, DC was wide open. Right. DC wide open. Everything coming in here now, man. You got the water, man. The coke, the crack, and all that coming. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? So it, it, it blew us up real quick. You know what I'm saying? Especially for for the youth and for my generation, they went crazy off that money, Snap. Yeah. It was so much money coming in our city, man. They went crazy. Them dudes went crazy, and then and that shifted a whole lot of stuff with junkyard at four for a short little spell, cause half of us had 
put our feet in the in the streets a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But see me, I, I went head first. I I was driven. Now I went head first. You know what I'm saying? I already had it in me. I mean, I got Dominican uncles, man. They they already motherfucker street dudes, man. Right. You know what I'm saying? My uncles that's here in DC, they lot niggas. So it's already in me. It's just a matter of me taking that choice on my own. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? I took the choice, but I caught myself and, and stepped back before I got really messed up. Well, that's good. How long did it how long did it take before you realized this is this I want to do the music? I don't want to do this. Like how long was it? 96. <laughs> 10 years? So 10 years? Yeah, I was I was deep, deep in it, man. I hated that I, I, I felt that life, man. Yeah. I hate that I had to feel that life, man. But it taught me a lot. It taught me a lot. Mm-hmm. I raised my kids real good, man, because my, my kids don't know nothing about that. You know what I'm saying? That's good. That's good. Well, so... Okay, so '86 things start to get a little crazy, and then what? The big what died. What's that? That was that was that was when Little Dirk died. Oh, okay. Because our manager, Big Dirk, started getting into the streets, so he 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 trying to he dealing drugs while he trying to manage us. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And then at the time, this man he he had to be moving real good. Cause other people was watching him, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So they tried to bring the man a move. With them bringing them a move, they took our band member to try to bring a move to the man. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. They kidnap our people. They kidnap our boy. We try to get to our manager. They kidnap Wait. our folk. They was, this is this is to me, man. This was the first murder of Steve. We started. All the youngest had started getting killed in the eighties. So you 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 breaking up a little bit. So I, I want to go back to that. So you said you who who was kidnapped in order to get at your manager? It was his name was Dirk Ingram. Dirk Ingram. He, he used to be on the front line with with uh, Mike Strong, Lil Dave, all them. Mm-hmm. One of the original front line dudes with bugs. You know what I'm saying? He was he was Lil older than me. He was like a year older than me because I was the baby at the time. So mm-hmm. kidnapped him, man, because they wanted to use him to get ransom money from our manager. Oh, man. That's crazy. Yeah. This, uh, this is like the end of, this like the ending of 86, 87 coming in. Go-Go Live is, is brewing up. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But at the time when all this is brewing up, turmoil is coming at us, though. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Turmoil was coming at us. This the, the Def Jam, everything kicked in at the time. Uh, Malika, everything was starting to come through. But then you got deaf people trying to kill us at the same time. Oh wow, I never knew that. So that so let's let's talk about that for a minute. Let's talk about the you know you're you're one of the very few go go bands in history to ever be signed to a, a major label. So how did that? How did that come about? The Def Jam thing. Actually, Molly, I don't even know. I I know how we met the man that got us up there, though. Okay, how was that? And who was that? It, it's it's we had a a night. It's a Friday night, 19th for them. Downtown. It's a it used to be a club down there called Rumors. Yep. All the rich people used to be at that spot. Mm-hmm. All the big money tycoon people that was in entertainment and all that, that was their chill spot away from everything. We used to be right across the street doing our little street thing. We we playing, cranking on the street. Got our little buggy going around, and this man named Perry Fingerbomb, man, came, used to come down this joint, and he, he said he watched us for like a month straight. He came every Friday. Just to come down there and look at our our routine, mm-hmm. he took he took what he saw. He took it back up New York and says and and talked to Rick. He brought Rick back down here. So also oh, Rick, 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 Rick saw y'all play on the corner. 
Yeah, we met Rick. We didn't even know who he was. Never knew nothing about Def Jam. We was kids. We didn't know nothing about that shit. Right. Look, he brought Rick to us. Rick standing there watching us. That's you know, Perry, Perry Fingerball, Rick, Mo Shorter, Big Dirk. They go over in a huddle, some motherfucker, way on the side. Two weeks later, we up New York playing in this club called the Dance Interior. Yep. Big, very famous club. Yep. In New York. Yeah. Hey, we playing in the Dance Interior. We went up there, joined Mali Cap three weeks straight. The third week, we saw Russ. You said the third week, what happened? It was curtains. It was curtains out of that. Okay. Russ said, man, back. He, he want us to sign. He said, I'm going to sign him a little bit. We, I got an idea for him. And then everything went through. We go to New York. We did a few more shows. We played at the Palladium. Another we did like, like three, four, five shows out inside the Palladium. We were in the dancing too, and then it was a uh, it was a club up there back for the rappers back then, and man, we we played the Roxy. Yep. Yeah, we played in that joint. We played in the Roxy. I did that. It was all to the races. You know what I'm saying? It was all to the races. And as you know, my my mom sitting at the table, my dad sitting at the table talking to Mo. As you know, we Def Jam artists now. You know what I'm saying? Okay. I still, ain't, I, I still ain't grab store on that ad. You know what I'm saying? Okay, that's Rick Lake. I'm, I'm, I'm a kid. I'm on kid stuff. I, I ain't thinking about that. When it's time for me to bang, let me know when to bang. Other than that, I'm running around. You know what I'm saying? I, none of that, it, it never got to me. It ain't, it ain't, it ain't never, I ain't never get to really grasp on it to it. Mm-hmm. Well, so when did you, how did you record? So, so. Obviously, they put out sardines and the word, which one I think sardines was the B side to the word, right? So, yeah. who? So, where did you record those two records in DC or in New York? We recorded them here in DC in Connecticut, up on Connecticut Avenue. But in the studio, or those were live tracks that were reading? Uh, it was in the studio. It was in the studio. Okay. So and that was the first time all of us ever been in the studio. So that was our first experience going through that. And that was amazing right there to see how, how that worked. Never knew how that how people had made records. And when I found out how they made records, that opened my eye to a whole lot of stuff. I wanted to be a little bit more nosy now. You know what I'm saying? Right. So was so. Do you remember who like was? Did Rick Rubin actually come down and produce the record, or was it somebody else? Yeah. He was, it was, Rick. It was Rick. Yeah, that's who we saw. Rick. Rick was always with us, man. Yeah. So that's that, whole, mean, little pro- that whole process through that Dev Jam. We was always with Rick. Rick was always with us. Rick and DMC. And DMC from Run DMC. Yeah, DMC was always with us. Nice. That's tough. so. What do you think? Because GoGo has traditionally always had, or not always had, but at some point had an issue with translating the live experience that is GoGo onto record. Clearly, you guys were able to do that with both of those records, at at least. And even more, I would say, I mean, go hard and creep through the hood to me. Same with sardines and the word. How were you able, do you think, to still keep the same intensity of the live experience and the authenticity of Gogo, but still make it sound like a bigger, more national sounding record? What do you think that was? It was it was um it was mental for us, man. It was nothing for us, man, because we we already we already come gutter, so you can't we ain't being watered down for nothing. You know what I'm saying? Oh, we, how we cool. come, that's how we But even 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 though it's not watered down, it still sounds like a real record. You know what I mean? It doesn't sound like I think it was I think it'd be the engineer, man. It'd be the engineer. You're supposed to still go in, even if you're in the studio or live, you're supposed to still go in there and put your product, your body of work in it. How you gonna post to feel it? How you want your people to feel it? Well, Would let me wanna, let me take I that. Go in, I, 
go in the studio in a live setting. I'm I'm already live. So I'm 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 gonna still play like I'm live. Well, well, I want to. I'm gonna visualize myself like I'm on the stage. So I'm gonna I'm perform like I'm on the stage. Right. I wanna. I wanna. Because I was gonna ask this or talk about this later, but you you mentioned the engineer, and and I, I want to talk about the live engineer for a second because there's a story that you probably don't even remember this, but you may or may not remember that I used to play in a band called Occupation that used to open for you guys a lot when you came down to Annapolis. And right. you may or may not remember that uh, before we really knew each other, we played, I, went, I was at Morgan State. I was going to Morgan State at the time and we played in Baltimore opening up for y'all at this big, I forget the name, but I think it was called Big Ben's or something. It was in Baltimore, but it was all Morgan State kids there from, you know, from DC or whatever. And I remember I was so excited and I was telling everybody at, at, at college that all my band is playing tonight. We're playing with Junkyard. But, and we got up there and I don't, I don't, whoever was the sound man that brought the system, it was, I'm assuming it was Rio's system and I don't know who brought it, but we didn't have an, our engineer. We weren't sophisticated enough. And I'm pretty sure y'all had Bochel at the time, if my memory serves correctly. And I remember we got up there and the sound was totally fucked up and we slum like shit because we couldn't hear ourselves and it was whack as shit. And I was so embarrassed. And I remember then you guys played and of course rocked the shit out of the whole fucking place. And I remember seeing you afterwards and I was like so embarrassed. And I was like, man, you know, our sound was fucked up. And you looked right at me and you were like, hey, it's the same sound we played on. You guys need to get an engineer. And I, that stuck with me for my whole life. Like you probably don't even remember that happening, but that stuck with me for a very long time. And that's when I really realized that it's about more than just a band getting up there and cranking. It's about the team that you build around yourself. And is. So you got a team, man, a team. Everybody got to be on that one page. That man on that PA got to feel like that PA is his instrument. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Well, he he flowed them effects and used that reverb and all that. You supposed to be in the groove right with us. Yep. If, if we are stepping in party, you supposed to have a little bop back there while you on that PA. Yeah. Because you in the band. You in the band too. Exactly. That's yeah, that's the point I wanted to make. Is that it's in, in any genre, but most specifically and especially in go go, because it's such a uh, a specific sound that not just your average engineer you know like i had i had sound guys engineers that worked for me when i ran entertainment at the casino but i wouldn't put them on a go-go band because they don't know how to do that shit. you know it's a very specific thing and so yeah, it's, a, it's a lot of different little tweaks that it got to be done to the pa for you can get that go-go feel out that thing man yeah 100 100 percent. so okay so what so okay so you got so rick Rick was around, DMC was around, you guys recorded the word sardines. How did you feel about it when it when when it came out? Like when it came out and you're like, hey, we just released a record on Def Jam. How did you feel? How did the band feel about that? I was crazy ecstatic. I ain't go to school for three days. <laughs> I bet and I bet when you came back, you were a superstar, weren't you? Man, I was scared to go to school for three days. <laughs> Cause my look, this was this was scared me, man. My dad said, "Yo, your homies gonna beat your ass, and nigga, you gonna get all the booty you want." <laughs> That's so what you're I ain't go to school for three days, dog. Yeah. I ain't know how to compute that. I didn't know how to compute that, cause he told me somebody gonna be trying to beat me up. Hold up, hold pop, you you smash my world up right there. <laughs> Because you about to snatch somebody's girl, that's why. That hey, is, I, mean, I, mean, I wasn't even thinking about girls at that time, right then and there. You know so what I'm saying? Hold up. Hold up. Let me back up. Hold up. Let me back up. All right. It's just before Go Go Live, I think right after Go Go Live, I had my first child, though. So you were thinking about girls then? Yeah, yeah. I had to think about it. So what came first? Was it would the Go Go Live come first, or did the Def Jam the out or the records come first? Which one? It came was Go Go Live. Go Go Live. Go Live. Okay. Yeah, and everything fell in with Def Jam right after that. Okay. 
Okay. But, you know, at that time, you, you had to have a record to be able to play in the Capitol Center. Right. You know, the, the entertainment people that was running that up there, they, they wouldn't let you come in there if you, if you wasn't nobody. Right. But uh, yeah, Daryl Brooks and Carol, yeah, uh, G, Street, G Street Express, now known as CD Enterprise, the same people that put on the uh, Summer Spirit Festival every every year. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Yep. I just found that out too. I I, yep. I never knew that till last year. Yeah, yeah. No, that's my that's my man, Daryl Brooks. I'm out. I, I've uh, hopefully he's gonna come on here pretty soon. He's pretty well. So, um, okay. So and then so was it just those two songs that came out? Was that the only single that came out on Def Jam before it was? Yep. Okay. Yep. We, we ain't never. They just they after that they just set us on the show. And why do you think that was? Because they didn't they didn't know how to market go go. Okay. So what do you think? So because it, it, one of the questions that I ask in the in the form that you fill out to come on the show is what do you think? Um, you know what what what? There's one thing, or I forget what how I word it, but if there's something that you think can propel go go outside of the D.C. area, what do you think it is? And your answer was. Um, more original music and better marketing. So while we're talking about the marketing, obviously we, we had we had the, the great original songs. I mean, Sardines wasn't technically original, but Coconut. And the word was, was uh, you know, the word was original. So what, what, what do you think at that point, obviously the business is totally different now, but at that point, what do you think Def Jam could have done differently like what would they you know to, to market it like what do you think they could have done differently or should have done differently or do you know came down here and really paid a, a whole lot more attention to how the real flow of go go really go okay so what do you think and I'm, I'm sorry to be so specific about this, but the whole reason I'm having it, I'm doing, part of the reason I'm doing this show is you obviously know, because you yeah, know and, who my objective is. And I feel like it, and our go go thing, it, it ain't too much different from hip hop and the rap and all R and B and none of that. It ain't no different from that. It ain't. It's it's not. Right. Right. It's like they, it's like they scared to touch us. It's it's just that it's some. It's like they scared to touch us. Well, so, so around that time, you also were in Tougher Than Leather, right? The band was in the, in the movie Tougher Than Leather. How, yeah. How, how did that come about and, and how did that feel? I'm sure you got, your pop said you gonna get a lot more booty off of that and you probably even got off the songs, huh? Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I feel like that, that, that Tougher Than Leather, that was just all into the package or whatever that they was all trying to do as far as while we was up here in Def Jam, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. We was we was new little kids at the time. Then Run DMC, the hottest thing smoking out there, and mm -hmm. their brother got one of the major labels. Mm -hmm. So they, it was just all a little a money play, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So the money play, that I, I ain't getting, I ain't get enough money. I ain't get enough money out of that shit. I know that from the from the movie or just from the whole Def Jam situation. Period. The whole the whole situation, and that's what uh me and, and uh Pop Mother about to start going doing some research right now because back then I I, I I remember I was registered in ASCAP through Junkyard because of that that sardines and stuff right mm -hmm. so and then I I tried to go I was doing some 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 work with a uh, couple of fellas man so we was going through. The ASCAP stuff getting me registered to make sure I can get my writers' rights and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So when we pull up my little information, ain't nothing come up. I'm like, oh look. So when I saw that, that's what put a green, put a light bulb on my head. Like, man, hold up. I remember sitting at this goddamn big ass boardroom table right at the other end from LL Cool J when he was signing his fucking deal. Cause we all signed our contracts on the same fucking day. So okay, so LL was at one end of the fucking table, and Junkyard was at the other end of the table with some other motherfucking uh people that was working for them, man. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 that's what puzzled me right there. You know what I'm saying? We we, we could have motherfucker did the same shit like Rock the Bell, all that. You know what I'm saying? 
Why you ain't put the same energy like you gave L and Beastie Boys and all them? You supposed to gave us that energy too, right? Because when you when we, when you got all us on the show up there in New York or or in Jersey somewhere doing them shows, you know, some of them promotion shows, man, we kicking they motherfucking ass on the junkyard shit. Well, go go, man. We, we rocking BC boys out, LL shit, all that. We cranking that shit out. Right. I'm sure. Got the, I'm sure. Got the New York going crazy. I'm a, hands in the air, all that. Man, I'm trying to tell you, man. I believe it. Bills is giving them crowd participation stuff back then. Mm-hmm. They had the whole palladium saying what he's saying. Right. So what do you think, what do you think is different? I mean, do you think that the only difference between, you know, LO, Cool J, or the way that they work with, because I, I, this is what I think, and I could be totally wrong, because obviously I wasn't there. I think that it's way easier for a record label to get on what they need to get done if you're only dealing with one person or three people than if you're dealing with 10 people. It's just hard to do. And sometimes it's, they just don't want to put it yeah. in the work. You know what I mean? And so whether that's right, wrong, or yeah. wrong, I just think that that's what the, what the answer is. I think that a lot of the reason that it's been so hard for Gogo to get over the hump is that Gogo is the one genre that's continued to have large bands. You know what I'm saying? And the rest of the industry has sort of moved past having large bands and has sort of gone down to you know one person or two people or maybe three people at the most. So this is my question that I've asked a lot of other people that have been on the show. Do you need to have like do you need to have a band to be a go-go artist? Like does that well let me rephrase that. Does a band does a go-go artist need to be a band to still be go-go? Yeah. Well, so, but this is the reason why I ask because Chuck Brown isn't a band. He's Chuck Brown and then he hires a band. You know what I mean? But, or, uh, you know, there are artists that like that perform live with a band, but the whole, but the artist isn't the band. It's an artist and then they have a band. You know what I'm saying? Is so, is that possible you think or no you think it has to be like in order to be true go-go it has to actually be a band performer like the band has to be the artist you see what i'm saying you see what i mean with the difference yeah i know where you at nah 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 because I, I i believe uh, like me if if i if i got some some music i want to do I, I i don't i don't need a whole band to do it yeah, I mean Mickey Mickey put out an album, you know what I'm saying, of just of, of, of his own stuff. And it was I mean, he had I'm sure he had a band in there recording, but not every single thing. But right. Uh, and I'm I'm about, I'm about to work on one of them now. All right, that's what's up. That's what's up. I can't wait to hear it. I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to it. Um and the thing I'm gonna do different, I'm I'm bringing all the new nephews in with me. Okay, okay. So uh, talk about that. Who you are listening to me? I'm introducing you to the to the, the what's coming behind me too. I love that because that's one thing that you hear a lot in GoGo is that the OGs don't you know reach the hand back down and and pull up in the same way that you were saying. You know, Benny sat and had conversations. I ain't never GoGo, talked about and you know, Jungle Boogie was showing you stuff. You know, I I ain't ne- I ain't never turned my back on. Yeah, I ain't never turned my back on on the youngest, even even while they got this bounce state. Po, if Polo was here, Polo would tell you. When that thing was going up, I was right there, out at all the outside joints. I was learning that bounce stuff. Yeah, Love and you know, Tony T, they be teaching me that stuff, man. They always kept me right there. They, I support them all the time. That's what's up. That's great. Well, so when you and then, ain't nobody never heard me say I don't like that bounce beat nothing. The bounce beat is go go. Okay, wait a minute. It just me, it's just saying go. It's saying to go go. Be used to. That's all. Let me let me. It's a whole new ever out here, man. 
let me let me make let me have you repeat that because there's a lot of conversation in these go go Facebook groups by a bunch of people that are you know not to not to, not to knock fans because fans are necessary, but I just want you to say that again. You're saying that bounce beat is go go. It is go go. Thank it's you. It's just not our era of go go. I couldn't agree more. It is go go. Hundred percent. It's Thank not you. our era. You know what I'm saying? I love the era has changed. They have to accept the era has changed. You know what I'm saying? Everybody ain't got to change with the era. You know what I'm saying? Right. But you gonna still accept it. I love it. You gonna have to accept it. They here, man. They here. They not going nowhere. And it's gonna evolve again. Cause the next two generations gonna have a whole totally different flavor. You know what I'm saying? Then you got go go to flipped again. How do you feel about that? How do you feel about is is there a next generation though? Because it seems like the younger demographic, you know, like the younger kids, they want to be rappers. They're not even tripping off being go go bands anymore. The young junks. Uh oh, you're breaking up a little bit. My grandkids. My grandkids, the young junk. Wait, say that. Say that again. You straight, up a little bit. You say your grandkids who? I gotta get back out of this car. Yeah, yeah. It seems like. Hey. Not a, not a I say my grandkids. Oh yeah. I got out of the car. Drive to the gas station. Yeah, call the young junks. Yeah. They, they call come out soon. Youngsters, you said? About to put them back to work. My son, my grandson. Huh? You said they're called the young I said my son, my grandson, the young junksters. I love it. I love it. Called the young junksters. I love it. I love it. So where I got you, man. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna make sure it's gonna be right. How can we? How can we hear them? Uh, do, uh, do they have anything okay. up yet, or they're just getting started, or what? They just get started. They did some some slight when I when I uh when I had first got released from the little the home school I had to go to. Mm -hmm. When I had got released from that joint, they did a little joint for me down in front of the shrimp boat. It's on YouTube too. Oh, it is. Okay, I'm gonna check it out. I'm gonna find it. I'm gonna put it. Uh, I'm gonna because uh, this this interview is gonna it's live right now, but it's gonna stay up on YouTube. So I'm gonna find um I'm gonna find uh, the link to that and put it in the um put it in this one so people can see it. So speaking of the, speaking of the youngsters and uh, right, how how often. When you guys were coming up to, on the bucket again, how often did you practice? How long? Do you remember? Man, Big Dick used to have us in there like something. It all depends. We was in there a lot in, in this little spot called the Scout House. Mm -hmm. That's where we used to do our little Boy Scout stuff. Then they used to, they let us have a let us use the house to do our practice for the band. But uh, we used to be in there like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. He let us chill for a day because we'll be playing Friday and Saturday. Mm -hmm. Sometime on Sundays, if the weather was good, we'll go do uh, Vendors Mall on Sundays. Mm -hmm. But we did Vin uh, Georgetown and 19th and them on Friday. We did uh, Vendors Mall DuPont Circle and 19th and them on Saturday and just did Vendors Mall on Sunday. Like how they did was rotating the go-go's. That was our little go-go spot. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, the reason it I was all outside. That's what's up. All outside. Yeah, that's why I was just talking to Conan from... You we know, had to pay nobody for the venue. Yeah, I was talking to Conan. I mean, she was back hey. down here DJing, man. Say it again. Got a little delay. I said, I wish he was down here DJing. Oh, you, you froze up a little bit, I think. Well, the, I, don't know, 
I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, you, I think you're all right now. But the, the reason I was asking about the practice is because the um, – like when I had Kyrie and I had uh, Jam and Jeff from Northeast Groovers on, they were talking about, you know, when they were coming up – obviously this was before I played in the band – they would rehearse four or five times a week for like six, seven hours a day. And nowadays it's like bands might practice once a week for two hours. And we wonder why the music mm. doesn't sound the same. I think that's got a lot to do with it, you know? Okay. All right. Yeah. So folks, I'm sorry. Um, what, what I'm going to do, I'm going to get Wink set up with somebody that he can, uh, he can, um, you know, have some strong Wi-Fi with, and we're going to, we're going to redo this and have a part two. Thank you everybody for tuning in so much. I really appreciate it. This was one of the best interviews we've had so far. I'm excited. Um, and I want to definitely want to keep it going. So um, unfortunately just having too many technical issues so we're going to make uh make this happen again and i'm going to uh find somewhere we can go and um and uh you know get on a stronger wi-fi uh so we'll definitely reschedule this one but thanks everybody for tuning in really appreciate it uh tomorrow i have um charles stevenson who is um the original manager from eu and uh thank you i really appreciate it um uh, Charles Stevenson, the original manager of EU and the co-author of uh, The Beat, Go-Go Music in uh, Washington, D.C. Yeah, definitely everybody check out The Young Junksters. Um, thank you, Laurie, for putting the link in here. Um, hopefully it's live. If not, once we, um, you know, once this, once this goes back up on YouTube, um, I'll make sure that the link is live so people can click to it. That's great. I think that's super dope. Um, so I know, man, I was waiting all day for this, too. I was excited. I'm, I'm, I still am excited. Like it was, it was awesome so far. So everybody make sure you stay tuned. Um, so you can subscribe to the YouTube channel at uh, youtube.com uh, slash go, go uh, which is uh, where most of you are right now. Um, some of you are on Facebook. So let me just put that up for you. It is, um, I realized I didn't, I must have deleted it by accident. YouTube.com slash go go ticks. So you can go to youtube.com slash go go ticks and subscribe. And if you click the little bell icon, um, then that will tell you when there's an episode about to start. You can also go to just go go ticks.co, which is uh, right up here go go ticks.co, not dot com, but dot co. And uh, the upcoming schedule is there. If you click on the button, um, underneath the show that you want to watch, you can go onto YouTube and just set a reminder for uh, any of the shows that are coming up that you want to watch. So make sure you do that. You can also uh, on the YouTube channel see all of my previous interviews. Um, interviewed, you know, everybody from Donnell Floyd to um, to Jam and Jeff to Kyrie to uh, my buddy Madi that works for Atlantic Records, my buddy Akil that works for RCA Records. Um, you know, there's all kinds of uh, uh, information on there. My, my objective is to figure out how we can connect the dots between GoGo -Go and how we know and love it and the greater music industry, because it's my dream to see the rest of the world um, exposed to, you know, the, the phenomenon that we all already know about. Because um, I just don't, just like me and Wake, we're talking about the beginning of this um you know, this interview, I just don't feel like there's any more powerful music in the world than go, go. And I just feel like I want the rest of the world to see it. I know some people don't agree, but that's how I feel. Um, so again, that's the whole purpose of the show. So all of these episodes are a means to that end. So check out, uh, previous episodes, uh, when you can, thank you guys, Alfonso and James for locking it in. I really appreciate you guys tuning in and, um, Stay tuned and uh, we'll figure out how to get Wink back on here. I'm going to give him a call now and uh, let him know we're just going to reschedule and uh, figure out a way to get him locked in on a little better Wi-Fi. So thanks again, guys. We'll see you tomorrow. Charles Stevenson, original uh, manager of EU and author, co-author of the beat uh, Go-Go Music from Washington, D.C. All right. We'll see you guys tomorrow. All right. Oh, thank you, Mimi. No problem. Yeah, I got. I have another episode tomorrow, so we won't be able to do it tomorrow. I'm booked up for the next few weeks, um, so we're gonna have to uh, to um, you know reschedule for another time. But it's fine. It, it happens. We'll make it work. Thank you, Mimi. I really appreciate uh, the heads up, and thank you again, everybody, for tuning in. All 